Hello, I'm Fernando Guerra. I'd like to welcome you to the 2009 Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University. We do these seminars throughout the spring sponsored with Channel 36. We have a great lineup for you tonight. For more information about tonight's panel and future panels, please visit our website at www.lmu.edu. Enjoy tonight's panel. 50 years of political diversity in Los Angeles, obviously 1959 to 2009. Again, we're documenting the change. That's all we're talking about today. We will then go on to explain the change and explain the difference that the change makes. And we will be asking our panelists really to focus on those last two questions in general from their personal experience and some of the stories that they lived through and uh, have um, really been involved with. Um, so we have the top 100 positions in Los Angeles County. There are over 2,000 positions that one can get elected to in Los Angeles County, including we have 95 school districts, 89 cities, of course the county, multiple uh, um, water districts. You can also get elected to be a judge, and you can also get elected to the uh, Central Committee of the Democratic, Republican, Green Party, and all those. If you add all those positions up, it's about uh, 2,000. I make a judgment that it's a little bit better to be uh, mayor of the city of Los Angeles than to be a central committee member of the Green Party. There's a difference between those two. And, but not just to have it be my opinion or the opinion of analysts, we've, we've used this criteria to determine what are the top 100 positions. First constituent size, the number of people that are in the district that this elected official uh, impacts. Number two, the budget size. How large and how much money do they have to impact public policy? And then number three, prestige of the position. And by that, we mean the career paths of elected officials themselves and the opinion of leaders. We interviewed over 58 of the individuals who have held one of these 100 positions and asked them to rank order the positions. And we also examined the career paths of these, every single person who has held one of these positions in the last 50 years. And what we got was this, okay? And this is the uh, pyramid of power in Los Angeles. We have a handout, so if it's not that clear for you. Um, and in this handout, this pyramid of power in the uh, 50 years of Los Angeles politics has never been violated. And what I mean by violated is that no one in a higher ranked position has ever given up that position to run for a lower ranked position. So for instance, and we have uh, State Senator Polanco here, he would never give up being State Senator to run for a school district while he could still run for re-election. Now there are cases where we have a former State Senator being an Assembly member or a City Council member, but that is after they were thrown out of the pyramid, either by term limits or defeat. So no one who could stay in the pyramid in the current position ever gave up a position to run for a lower one. It's an intuitive thing. You always seek greater power. You always seek greater influence. You don't give up a position of power for a lesser one, especially if you're going to stay in public office. Why go through all that? And so, again, in the boards that we have outside in the atrium, at the very top you will see the 471 names listed. Not a single case again where that uh, um, violates this pyramid of power. Everything goes up, nothing goes down. It's either up or out when it comes to uh, uh, politics. And then we have some pioneers that we talked about. In 1959, out of the 100 positions, there was only one African American, which was uh, then Assembly Member Augustus Hawkins, who ended up uh, running for Congress in 1962, and I think he stayed there until 1992 when uh, uh, Maxine Waters might have replaced him. Uh, we had then Councilman Ed Royalball, who also ended up in Congress in 1962, and we had Roz Wyman. Uh, who was also the only woman at that time. So she was a twofer, a Jew and a female. And the amazing story is when she got elected to the Los Angeles City Council in 1953, she was the youngest person ever elected to the City Council. She was the first woman elected to the City Council. And she was the first Jew elected to the City Council in, that, in the 20th century. And so you could see that she was an oddity, a rarity, when she got to the Los Angeles City Council and hung out with 14, or excuse me, because Ed Royalball was there at the same time with 13 white males, uh, non-Hispanic, non-Jewish uh, council members. 
Um, and then Al Song, who got elected in 1962 to the State Assembly, then went on to the State Senate. These are some of our pioneers, and they're the first of their um, ethnic group to get elected to one of these 100 positions uh, in the 20th uh, century. And there it is for just, we couldn't put all 100. We have a, a, this same chart outside uh, in the uh, atrium, but expanded greatly. Here we only have 18 positions, the 15 council members and the Los Angeles City executives. And uh, um, again, in the atrium, we have all 100. And here we've cut some of the years out just to be able to fit it in. But you could see that in 1959, you have Ed Royball and Roz Wyman. And then in 1963, something amazing happens when you get three African Americans elected. And it's a, a very interesting question. And then you follow up in those, those three seats, District 8, 9, and 10, from 1963 to the present have been held by an African American, including uh, Council Member Bernard Park, who's here with us today. And here's the, uh, the, the line graph representing the change that has happened over the 50 years. The line on top are uh, Anglos, and you can see the, uh, the decreasing numbers, and the lines below, are the blue line are Jews, and you can see how well they do, especially in the 80s and then decline somewhat a little bit. Then Latinos, who are now 33 of the 100, which is two more than Anglos. And then um, African Americans, who've been a pretty steady rise, and then pretty steady in terms of 15, 16 for the last 10, 15 years. And then Asians, who uh, only have four positions right now. The interesting question today in Los Angeles County, in the city of Los Angeles, the Asian and African American population is about equal, about 12% yet we have four times as much African-American representation as Asian representation. And we can explore that uh, question when our panelists get up here. And then here's just a different uh, presentation in terms of bar graph form for what we have seen. And then here's some of the work that was done by our students. Uh, I have both uh, Andrea and Rachel who are out in the audience. I won't embarrass, well, I will embarrass them. Why don't you stand up, where's Andrea? Andrea's right here. Stand up, Andrea. And where's Rachel? There. This is, this is their research. They replicated this study for the city of Inglewood and the city of Huntington Park. I think what's important is I want to show you that the difference between the 100 positions and these other 1,900 positions, that the people in those 100 come from these. So we have right here Curtis uh, Tucker, who in 1973 got elected to the Inglewood City Council. He was the first black elected to the Inglewood City Council, and he end up, ended up in the State Assembly and was there for over 20 years. Uh, we also have um, Curran Price and uh, Jerome Horton, who went on to the State Assembly, and then uh, the former mayor of Inglewood, uh, who went on to Ed Vincent, who went on to the state legislature. So it's a recruitment here. Uh, we've had several members of the uh, Huntington Park City Council attempt to run for the State Assembly or think about running, but of course we've had someone who not only went beyond the 100 but became actually U.S. Treasurer, and if you take out a dollar bill, there's a chance that her signature might be on there, and that's Rosario Marin, who who's on, uh, was on the Huntington Park City Council. But you could dra dramatically see that in 19... Um, you, you, close to the 1990s, there were no Latinos on that city council, even though Latinos made up over 85% of the population. And very quickly, all five council members become uh, Latinos. So there was an incredibly fast transition, not 50 years, but here it took only five years to go from an all-white city council to an all-Latino city council. Very similar in terms of commerce. There's just been a greater representation for a longer time. And then Pomona, you also have uh, Nell Soto, who is a, a councilwoman, ended up in the State Assembly, State, uh, state Senate. You also have Norma Torres, who was just mayor of Pomona, who ended up in the State Assembly. Again, the recruitment and the, the area that uh, these, many of these uh, members in the 100 come from are, are local cities. And then Walnut now has a majority Asian uh, Council, three out of the five council members are Asian. You also see that in the city of Carson, and we've had that in the uh, uh, city of San Gabriel as well. And then in Glendale, a totally different ethnic dynamic here in that the majority, three out of the five council members are Armenian. We've been talking about Latinos, uh, African Americans, etc. But here, a new group of, uh, of uh, ethnic community has emerged in Glendale, and three out of the five are um, are Armenian. So when we think about ethnic politics in Los Angeles, it goes beyond just the traditional groups that we've been thinking about. 
And um, this is the, uh, the gender in terms of the number of women. Still some room, but given that it was one back here, and we're almost to in the uh, high 30s. And this is what we call the family tree. Yes, there's been a tremendous change in the leadership of Los Angeles, but there's still some things that continue to ring true, and that is that family ties, like royalty, continue to dominate in L.A. politics. And so we have um, the uh, different uh, uh, family groupings. We have the, the, excuse me, the, the spouses. There have been many spouses who have preceded each other. Uh, here is Judy Chu is the first one where the female was first elected and she was followed by her husband. All the others, it was the male who was elected first. Um, we also have some siblings, including some famous siblings, Jerry Brown, who became governor, Kathleen Brown, who became uh, a treasurer, and then we have some um, um, other uh, individuals, like the Calderon brothers, that, uh, count, excuse me, State Senator Polanco could talk about. And then we have some um, other uh, groupings that we have here. And then just the city of Los Angeles census population, so we can see you, show you the, the changing in, uh, in terms of the uh, population that, that has occurred in the city of Los Angeles. And then we have the county uh, population. And, uh, and here's the graphic representation of what's happened to the population in uh, the county of Los Angeles. Okay, what I'm going to do is invite our panelists to come up here and we can start the conversation about uh, how did this happen and so what? What does it mean? Let me do some quick introductions. Um, it's really incredible the caliber of people that we have up here, not only as individuals, but the political careers that they've had uh, in, in Los Angeles. Um, you know what, I'm not even gonna use uh, the bios. I'm just gonna talk uh, about them. Uh, Senator Polanco, he's now retired, was uh, first elected to the state assembly and then served in the state, uh, state senate. He was majority leader of the state senate, the second most powerful Democrat for about four years. I forget how long you, you had that title before. Uh, he was uh, forced to retire because of term limits. I am convinced had there been no term limits, this uh, individual would still be there. Um, I have called them both in press, in the media, and also in uh, academic journals that I've written about the godfather of modern Latino politics, and we'll get into that in a, in a little while in terms of his ability to recruit, endorse, uh, and really mobilize on behalf of Latino candidates. Um, next to him is uh, Mark Slavkin. Um, he's very familiar with LMU and many of you students because his house backs up to the university over on Meccano and to all the dorms. So it's not unusual that I get a call from him at midnight because he, and I say, what's up? He says, I want to wake you up because they're waking me up. Uh, <laughs> Mark is a, um, was a former uh, school board member and uh, was president of the school board, had also uh, run for uh, assembly, and then before that had served as a, um, uh, a staffer for uh, County Board of Supervisor Ed Edelman. He's currently vice president at the Music Center for Education Programs. Um, next to him is uh, Council Member Bernard Parks, uh, was formerly a police chief for many years. Uh, after being police chief, he decided to, he wanted to get on the policy side, and he's uh, uh, been uh, on the uh, council for several years. He also just recently ran for County Board of Supervisor. Uh, next to him is uh, Mike Wu, who was on the Los Angeles uh, City Council for four years. He gave up his seat to run for um, a uh, mayor, and in 1993 ran against uh, uh, Richard uh, Reardon. I know that both uh, um, uh, Senator Polanco and myself worked on that campaign uh, and to no avail. Sorry, Mike. Uh, it, it helped. Okay. And he's currently an adjunct professor over at USC and continues to be active in civic and, and, and politics. He's the uh, uh, commissioner for the Los Angeles City Planning Commission and also serves on all kinds of different uh, boards. So um, these are our panelists. And one of the things that I, I want to start talking about is are you, you, all four of you have lived this. You've been part of this. You intuitively know what's happened. But when you see it in terms of the representation, what, uh, uh, impresses you most or what impact or what, what's the reaction that you first have about seeing this tremendous change that has happened in the last 50 years? Start with you, Richard, and then we'll go down the line. I think uh, the impact of diversity is very, very critical and important to the public policy discussion. I say that because I believe the experience, 
that people live has to be part of that policy development. That experience matters. It makes a difference. And I attest to the fact that that diversity, that diverse experience that people today bring to the legislature and to the various public bodies is making a real difference on the outcome of that particular policy consideration. And so uh, I'll close by just saying corporate America gets it from a business sense really, really well. Government on the public policy side moves a little slower, but it has arrived and it continues to grow and it must continue to grow as evident by what takes place when communities like the Armenian community who is now maturing politically, having a voice and making a difference in their communities. That to me is what diversity means. Mark? I love LMU students. I just want to disclose that. Fernando made me sound like this crazy neighbor guy that's like screaming mm -hmm. at the kids. Um, <laughs> so I just want to make that uh, clear. Um, well, let me just put some issues on the, on the table. Maybe we can come, come back to them. Um, Fernando did mention, but I'm Jewish and come from a West Side kind of political tradition in, in uh, the Jewish community. Um, and Jews are just dramatically overrepresented in all the slides by any kind of population measure. And the Jewish community, to some extent, takes that for granted and isn't as hungry, in a way, to raise the numbers and count how many officials there are as some of the other communities. Um, having access and influence, I think, are more important for communities that feel historically shut out and not a seat at the table. And Jews were historically shut out in LA, that kind of elite institution like the California Club downtown, which is a big uh, sort of insider where real business gets done in LA, didn't admit the first Jew until the late 70s, which is kind of remarkable. And yet in the political world, Jews are overrepresented. When I was on the school board, LAUSD school board, I think four of the seven members were Jewish, um, which is kind of remarkable. So that's one issue. The other thing we talk about is reapportionment. I was involved when I worked for Ed Edelman in the effort to carve out a new district among the five supervisors that was intended to give Latinos a better chance of electing a Latino. And Gloria Molina ultimately came to that seat. Um, that was carved out in a kind of game of musical chairs among the other districts. And my boss, Ed Edelman, and Richard, former boss, Ed Edelman, was at risk until Pete Chabarum chose to retire. Um, on the school board, I was involved in the effort when the city council, and Mike may have been there, and Joy Pikus is with us, um, were under the gun to carve out a new district for a Latino. So it's not all race neutral in how districts are drawn, and there's some history to how certain groups have secured power or been shut out from power. So um, the reapportionment issue, I think, is, is something to, uh, to look at. Um, what gives me hope, I'll just end on this over the long term, is that Latinos, as they become the overwhelming demographic, demographic majority, become the prime users and receivers of public services. And when there is a Latino voting majority, and when our school districts are 80% Latino students, the school districts will be better funded and more responsive than they are now when there's a disconnect between the Latino kids who are in school and a still mostly older, more white, uh, electorate who is less interested because they're not their kids and, and are less supportive of, of schooling. So um, I think the long-term demographic trend is driving the Latino n number like that, but there's been a great lag between the demographics and political representation, and we can also talk about yeah. that. Councilman Parks. Thank you very much, Fernando, for the invitation. I, I having lived in Los Angeles most of my life, I've seen uh, this an issue of diversity change our neighborhoods from or and I lived on the east side of the city of Los Angeles, uh, from white to black to, uh, to Latino. And now that you also see that in a large percentage of our, uh, what was commonly referred to as the black community, a large proportion of uh, Asian business people. So that transition kind of uh, continues to evolve. And I think what is important to realize is that uh, when we talk about diversity or the way I look at diversity, it's, it's a much greater uh, and broader subject than just counting colors. Because I think it's uh, a misrepresentation uh, when we think about diversity to just say, well, we have so many blacks, so many Hispanics. 
I think diversity also takes into uh, the discussion what your thought process is, because you might come from different experiences, but if you're all saying the same thing, often you're leaving other people out. And so it's a matter of diversity of thought is equally as important as the ethnic breakdown as it relates to color, size, gender, and all of those things. So I think when you look at it across the board, you're really trying to uh, gather what is the best in, in a human sense for those that you represent. And I think every group goes through the same evolution. Uh, first is the thought that sheer numbers will overwhelm the system and you'll be able to vote as a block and get what you want. Then reality sets in and realizes that coalitions uh, now and in the future are going to be even of a greater concern because no one will have a power base that will overwhelm in any given direction. So I think these are all thoughts. And most communities come about them in different ways. Some have been more quickly involved in the political process than others, but they all get there eventually. But I don't think you get the true sense of diversity if you just count the numbers and say by color what the diversity is. It's really the level of different thoughts, different backgrounds, who's bringing something to that uh, equation to create public policy. Uh, Professor Wu. Um, I remember one time I was walking through the rotunda in LA City Hall. There was a glass case in the rotunda with an, an old book that was opened up for people to look at. And what it was, was uh, the handwritten minutes of an LA City Council meeting uh, dating back to 1885. Uh, so I, I, was, I was walking by, looked at it, and it was opened up to a discussion in the LA City Council about how city government should respond to the public health hazards created by having large numbers of Chinese immigrants living uh, in Los Angeles, a and what should the government do about it. So here I was, a member of the city council, uh, ironically or coincidentally elected uh, 100 years after uh, this entry in the, in the minutes took place. And I thought, well, maybe, so maybe there is some reflection of some progress within the city over a period of 100 years. Uh, but as, as I think about the role of Asian Americans in local politics in LA and Southern California, it seems to me that um, the case of Asian Americans raises uh, a kind of a, a dilemma or anomaly which may be different than the path, the, the path that was taken by Latinos, African Americans, or Jewish Americans. Um, the fact that I was elected to the city council uh, might make a certain amount of sense given the rising number of Asian Americans in the city. But, I, but when people ask me about this, I sometimes point out that I was elected in a district where Asian Americans made up only about 10% of the population and only about 5% of the voters. In other words, um, it, was, it was probably significant, not so significant that I was Chinese American, but, uh, but I, I think about the experience I had doing my first um, television commercial in the Armenian language. Uh, even though it looks like I don't speak Armenian, I, I, I did it phonetically, but it was necessary in order to address the coalition that I hope to put together to win an election. Sometimes I think that the, the next Asian American to be elected to the LA City Council may not come from Koreatown, may not come from Little Tokyo or Thai Town or Chinatown, but I think perhaps the path for the next Asian American to be elected to the LA City Council may be from a district like the district I was elected in, in which there is no single dominant ethnic group, uh, including a, a dominant population of Asian Americans. I also think it's important to point out that perhaps another difference in, in, in the attitude towards politics is that for many Asian Americans, I would say there's a kind of profound ambivalence about how important is politics to our communities. Um, whereas for other ethnic groups, politics, access to government, having people elected may have been important in terms of being able to get things for the community, uh, perhaps partially in response to a system that didn't seem very open to Asian Americans. I think a lot of Asian Americans have emphasized other routes to, to upward mobility, other routes to success. Um, a lot of Asian American parents would rather encourage their kids to become a dentist or a nurse or an engineer or uh, a business owner rather than going into politics. And then there are a number of other practical 
challenges to face, which, such as where are the concentrations of Asian Americans comparable to the concentrations of Jewish Americans, Latinos, or African Americans who can provide a, a, a political base for someone who wants to get elected. If you look at Chinatown, Koreatown, Little Tokyo, there are certain concentrations of Asian Americans, but in most of those places, there are, are even more Latinos or even more African Americans than there are Asian Americans, and so, and who have a strong sense of territoriality that is difficult for Asian Americans to overcome. Now, there is a record of some success in the San Gabriel Valley, especially in some of the smaller cities where it's easier, it doesn't cost as much money, there may not be the same kind of barriers to entry to the system for Asian Americans, and you're starting to see uh, more and more suburban cities in the San Gabriel Valley, to some extent in Orange County, where uh, Asian Americans are starting to get elected to public office. And there is also the prospect that Judy Chu may become the first Asian American to be elected to Congress from Southern California. But uh, I think that um, the, some of the geographic issues some of the demographic issues, and some of the cultural issues among Asian Americans uh, in a way create barriers for Asian Americans to move upward. Uh, in, in some ways they reflect opportunities that Asian Americans have that other ethnic minorities may not have. And so this all, I think, contributes to a very complicated situation in terms of the future outlook for Asian Americans in pol politics. So let me ask, how do you become an elected official? Irrespective of ethnicity, um, when someone wants to say, I want to run for public office, uh, and I'll just one pattern, all four of you previously served in government or in a, some type of staff position or a police chief, so you were aware, very much aware of government before you ran. Is it necessary for you to be a, uh, Mark, you mentioned that uh, Senator Polanco had previously worked in the staff of Ed Edelman, but also Richard Alatorre, you worked on Ed Edelman's staff. Uh, Mike Wu worked on the staff of uh, Dave Roberti, who, by the way, is a Loyola Marymount grad. Uh, so, and then, of course, uh, Councilman Parks was police chief. So you guys were very much, uh, so do you, is that the route that one has to take? What is the recruitment route to become an elected official in these top 100? Richard? Everyone has the right to run for office. What the individual gets to ask themselves is, and should ask themselves, am I viable? What does it mean? I'm viable. Well, it means to me, what have you done in your community so that you don't have to run a campaign on promises, but you can run a campaign showing your contribution of service to the people that you are asking to support you? How much money can you raise? because that matters in a campaign. And under these restrictions, it matters even more. Back in my days, you had disclosure, which you had to do, but you were allowed to transfer. And so we were able to identify and recruit people who were viable, who had a history, had a commitment, couldn't raise maybe very much money, could articulate the issues, was a crossover candidate, ran many a times candidates in non-Latino districts. The myth or the perception is most Latinos are representing districts that are majority Latino districts voting population. Well, we broke that ceiling time and time again. And we broke it because the candidate was a viable candidate, was committed, had a history of contribution, didn't come and have to promise, and carried out a campaign that was very effective in contacting and delivering the messages that were resonating with people. Mark, Senator Polanco is right. Anybody can run for office, but it's clear that you guys had an advantage because you were staffers and you knew the political system. You knew who had previously run, how to run a campaign, et cetera. What are some of the advantages of, of being on a, on a staff? Well, I mean, I think it's incredibly important and noble to run for office, so I don't offer this in the spirit of depressing everybody. Um, but I worry that it is, it is very different when I ran. It is more of a closed shop today than it was. There are very powerful organized interests, some racially based, many union based, some have other interests based, um, that are in a position now in many of the seats of that top 100 to tell people who's viable and who's not viable. 
It's not a free market open system. You run, you run, you run. You get speeches, you go door to door, you raise money, may the best person win. There is a winnowing process where important interests like the County Federation of Labor, like some of the business coalitions, like some existing elected officials, like our mayor or others who, who wield influence, who are gatekeepers to say, well, all four of you are running, but we've decided to put all of our eggs in the basket of this candidate. And guess what? This candidate tends to win. So we could talk about that, that racial aspect. But for example, in an assembly seat that's held by an African-American, let's say Karen Bass, who's the speaker of the assembly and represents Culver City and some of the mid-city area. In recent history, that's been an African-American district. Should she leave, or term limits, um, there will be many interests in the African-American community who believe it is really important to maintain that district with African-American representation. There may be others in the Latino community who do an analysis and say no, and there is a behind the scenes or sometimes in front of the scenes real battle that goes on of other interests, other power, other money that's using the candidates as sort of proxies for their larger agenda to determine who wins. In some districts, it's the California Chamber of Commerce. In some districts, it's the California Realtors. But these are other forces that transcend term limits who are weighing in in a big way now, much more than when I ran, or, or and maybe even uh, Richard. When I ran, UTLA was one of the big players in the school board race. I was a 27-year-old, nice kid, running against an incumbent. People patted me on the, back, on the head and said, that's cute that you're running, but you don't really have a chance, you know, because you're running against an incumbent who all of us are endorsing, including David Roberti and Richard Reardon and many others. So they were all with the other guy, nobody was with me, and people were very dismissive of my candidacy. When I made it into a runoff, I think through hustle, UTLA, the teachers union, got involved and said, we are now going to get behind Mark. And they sent a young staffer named Antonio Villaragosa to do the field organizing for my campaign in 1989. Um, and we ended up, not just thanks to him, but lots of others, we ended up winning. Had UTLA not decided to get in the race and get behind me, as charming and articulate as I am, I would have lost. And good looking, you forgot. And good looking. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't want us to be naive or not recognize these other forces that stand behind the chart who have very intense interests. And I think increasingly, because there is no media anymore, the LA Times is basically folded. TV doesn't cover these races. People don't know what's going on. It is these organized interests, some racially based, some union, labor, business based who are prescribing or dictating which candidate will proceed in an otherwise open field. Councilman Parks, take us back to you retire as police chief. You then make the decision that you're going to run for city council. How did you make that decision? What was the process? Who did you talk to? Uh, and how did you go about putting together a team to run? Well, I think, first of all, uh, having been a police officer for almost uh, 40 years, that was the last thing on my mind is to run for office. And the thing that came about was when I retired, I had a number of people that called and talked about, would you consider it? Uh, and I said, no, because I had never, it's foreign to me in the sense of being a police officer to go out and ask people for money to do something that we call public service. And, but yet you realize quickly you can't run without funds. And then you have to go through this process of vetting, as was mentioned by Mark earlier, and those are foreign objects also. And what you had to do is make this mental transition as a police officer. You were looking always as how do you solve a problem for the betterment of the larger good. You often did not have any stake as to whether it benefited you one way or another. And then all of a sudden you're in a transition to say how do you then start using the I word and figuring out how you differ from other people and how do you get the money and how do you attract people. And so it's a major mental transition. Uh, but the one thing that caused me to make that decision was it became clear it's public service just at a different angle. And when, uh, what I appreciated was that as a police officer for almost 40 years, you always ended up at the scene when everything was about done and you were cleaning up somebody else's mess. And you were also in a situation to where uh, someone was always unhappy. Uh, unlike firefighters, everybody's happy when they show up because they put the fire out, they get the cat out of the tree and they leave. In the police department, your <laughs> tendency is somebody often left with you, which meant that they were unhappy or someone else was unhappy because you showed up. Other people were happy because you stopped what was going on. 
what you found in being in the council is that it basically gave you at least an impression that you could work on public service on the front end to where as you sit in budget sessions you can say how can we set money put money in a place that might end up impacting the front end of the system how can you set priorities as it relates to dealing with transportation so you found that you could do public service but you can look at it at a different level and a different angle and that you begin to see that uh, public service is basically public service and there's a variety of ways you can go about doing it and so here you make that transition and the issue is you're constantly reminding yourself that you're in a different business because you have to get reelected every four years and those are things are important so you have to constantly transition from just do a good job go back to get in your car and drive away and get the next radio call as opposed to looking at ways in which you're constantly figuring out how do you let the public know that you're doing a good job and so those are mental transitions that you have to make and but on the other hand I appreciate the fact I did not grow up running for office because it gives you a different perspective than those who have run for office versus that you actually worked within government you worked in public service so you have a totally different view of the world often than if you just spent your life getting reelected or moving from position to position. So you asked your wife if you could run. Well, I did ask her because, you know, one of the things, uh, and this is a very, one of the things I tell you right now, if you are going to be in public service, you can't do public service individually. It's a family affair. What you'll find for anyone on this panel, anyone you speak to, if you had a separate life called family life and a separate life called public life, you would never see your family. So the more you incorporate them into your day-to-day -day activities, the more you find you get a chance to spend time with them. So the issue is, is a very public process. And the thing you find when you get home, they sense the slights far greater than you do. They'll read an article and read into it far greater to where you slough it off and they're saying they're incensed. And my wife particularly had just gotten to the point where her home was exactly the way she wanted it and we were one block out of the district I was running for, and we had to move. And she's never let me forget that. Oh. <laughs> so who, but once your wife got over you moving, who else did you talk to about running? Well, I talked to several people. I talked to people that were in office to talk about it. I went out and talked to people that would be interested in seeing if they were in the, uh, financial uh, issues, talked to an array of people that, uh, would be helpful in the sense of helping to structure our campaign. So you make that gamut of people. And these are brand new faces because a lot of these people during my police career, you just waved at parties and said hi because you never had a relationship with them. And all of a sudden now you're developing a relationship with a group of people you've never had that opportunity before. Mike, you were a city council member. You could have run for reelection and stayed there for another probably 20 years before term limits hit. Okay? <laughs> And, uh, but you decided to run for mayor. Why did you do that? Well, uh, I could give you the short-term answer and the long-term answer. The, uh, the long-term answer is that I was going to say, try the short-term answer. Okay. All right. Well, when I, when, I was the age, when I was the age of most of the students in this room, it was at a time when America was going through this historic uh, a period that some people called the urban crisis. There were riots going on in places like uh, Harlem, uh, Chicago, uh, Detroit, and Los Angeles. And um, uh, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up, um, I, I was partially inspired by the example of some of the charismatic mayors in some of the cities who were trying to hold their cities together and provide some leadership. Uh, and eventually I decided uh, urban planning must have something to do with cities, so I should go to urban planning school. But I think that that having grown up in the 1960s and 70s and watching what happened in my own city and other cities, I think that it planted the seed of an idea that maybe if you're mayor of a city, you can actually do something. You can have the power to actually make a city a better place. And so I think that was in the back of my head. And then after serving on the city council for eight years, um, it, uh, Tom Bradley decided to retire. Uh, which was an historic event in Los Angeles to the extent that it had been 20 years since the last time there had been an open race for mayor. And so um, I, 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 I tried to figure out what's the right thing for me to do. 
uh, some of my colleagues on the city council had been on the council for a long time. And um, I didn't think that I wanted to get to the point of getting bored with my job. Uh, and I thought maybe I was ready for a change. And also I thought if I wait, I may not have a better opportunity than I did that year. That is, if I, if I stayed with the safe path of staying with my council seat, maybe someone else would get elected and maybe I wouldn't have a chance for another four years or eight years. So after thinking about it and weighing my chances and trying to figure out what it would take to be successful, uh, I decided to give up my council seat and uh, see what would happen. But for me, it was uh, basically an all or nothing proposition. Uh, looking back on it, I would say that the experience of running for mayor in this city was probably the most exciting experience I've had in my entire life, probably also the most exhausting experience I've had in my entire life. But I think that, uh, while I don't know if I would recommend it for everyone in the room to try it, uh, you do learn things about a city that you don't learn any other way. You go to not just the most visible places, but the most, some of the places that are not really visible to the naked eye, but you learn things about what makes a city tick that you can't learn any other way. Senator Polanco guaranteed me that you were going to win. Why did you lose? Yeah, Richard. <laughs> no, no, let, let's get Why did you, why'd you lose, Mike? Uh, I mean, well, the short answer is I didn't get enough votes. But, but, but the reason, <laughs> but the, but the reason for, the reason okay, for Let that, me rephrase. Easy one. Good, yeah. one. Good one. Right, right, let right, me rephrase the question. <laughs> why didn't you get enough votes? <laughs> okay. There you go. Uh, I think there are a combination of reasons. Uh, I, I think that ultimately, I wasn't able to put together a broad enough coalition to win. Um, it wasn't enough, for example, in my case, to try to hold together what was considered the traditional Bradley coalition, because especially in the year after there was considerable uh, violence and social unrest in some parts of the city, I think it was difficult to run as a non-white candidate in the city. Uh, also, I think that uh, being the, I think, I think I was the first Asian American to run for mayor of Los Angeles, some of the barriers that I had to overcome as a council candidate, and which took me two races to get past in terms of getting non-Asian Americans to think of me uh, uh, not as, say, a suitable candidate for being a dentist or for being a business owner, but to actually think of an Asian American uh, as being potentially the chief executive of the, of the second largest city in the country required getting past, I think, some stereotypes in the minds of some voters. Uh, so I think that that was a challenge. And I think that after 20 years of having um, Tom Bradley as mayor, there were a lot of voters who wanted a change. And I think that in some ways, uh, uh, Richard Reardon represented a change much more than I did. So, um, so I think those are some of the reasons. That and also, if I had it to do over, I think I would prefer to be born as a millionaire. <laughs> Make a note. <laughs> yes. So, Richard, here's a, a paradox. When we're talking about um, Asians getting elected to office and Latinos getting elected to office, there's clearly, in terms of our data, many more Latinos that have gotten elected to these 100 positions. But when you take a look at the statewide office, there have been many more Asian Americans who've been elected to statewide office. Currently, right now, John Chung is controller, but we've also had a U.S. senator who's been, who is Asian, a secretary of state, a treasurer. So there are at least four, maybe five Asian Americans who've won statewide, yet only one Latino. How, can, how is it that Asian Americans are able to win statewide office but not be very successful in these 100, yet Latinos are incredibly successful in these 100 but very unsuccessful in winning statewide office? I think there's a, there's a combination of, of, of issues. I think part of it uh, is the economic base uh, that uh, the Asian community has been able to build a very viable uh, up and down the state. You go into communities and you see total revitalization. Uh, I think you have uh, candidates who are able to articulate uh, the issues uh, much more effective than, than Latino candidates. Uh, and so the net result is that you have more. And that's good because we are, in fact, then electing that candidate who is uh, capable of carrying out uh, and representing and doing a good job as they are. Uh, the Latino community, albeit, is large in numbers, 
population-wise, still very small in numbers from a voter registration. You have the issues of uh, the anti-immigrant bashing that uh, either resonates uh, given hard economic times uh, and does resonate, uh, and when it's not resonating, still subtle, uh, the anti-187 uh, proposition, uh, the most uh, recent with all the commentary. Uh, and so I think there's, there's, there's a lot of, of uh, undertones that are more uh, readily available to adversely impact a Latino candidate uh, than an Asian American candidate. Mike, sort of the same question, but something that we've seen in our data, if you go out there and you take a look at the board, is once an African American wins a position, and we colored it, I think, in beige or brown, I forget what color, you see that color almost continues forever. Once a Latino wins a position, it somewhat continues forever, and, but for Asians, it, it's sporadic. And so we created what we call a sustainability um, index. And this, the question was very simply, once a position is held by an ethnic, did the same ethnic uh, replace that person once they were either defeated, term limited out, or went? In? And African Americans had a sustainability score of 85, meaning 85% of the time a black replaced a black. Latinos had a sustainability score of 80%. Okay? Asians, up until Mike King replaced Judy Chu, had a sustainability score of zero. In, none of the fi in the whole 50 years, we never had an Asian replace an Asian elected office holder until Mike Yang replaced Judy Chu, which, by the way, they're married, so we don't know if it was a spouse factor or the Asian factor. Mm -hmm. um, what, kind of the, the, that question, what the difficulty of Asians to be able to sustain representation, their ability to gain statewide office but not local office? Well, um, Fernando, I think it has a lot to do with the pipeline. That is, is there a pipeline uh, comparable to the pipelines in the Latino community or the African American community producing young, qualified Asian Americans who are in a position to uh, capitalize on whatever it is they've got, whether it's connections to rich people, uh, uh, access to organizations that can mobilize volunteers. And, and the problem with, for Asian Americans is there's a very small pipeline. I think it's, it's developing to some extent in places like the San Gabriel Valley. But just to use my own example, could I have groomed an Asian American to uh, run for my council seat when I moved out? Uh, I could have, except I was really busy running for mayor. And, and, uh, and the thing is, I can't think of who would that Asian American have been. Uh, and. Uh, and so, so I, I think a lot of it has to do with the pipeline. I wanted to follow up also on, on Richard's answer uh, and your question to Richard about why, uh, why did Asian Americans seem to do well on the statewide office level, uh, whereas Latinos seem to do very well at, at the local level, but not so well in a statewide race. I think that you've put your finger on both the strength and the weakness of the two political communities, to the extent that Latinos have been able to organize extremely well on a district basis and to mobilize the numbers, the, the co concentrations of population, uh, and to create organizations to elect people at a district level, whether it's an assembly district, a city council district. But on the statewide level, it's a whole different game, where that kind of district-oriented organizing isn't as important, but instead, as, as you alluded to in your question, the ability to raise, lar raise large amounts of money, the ability to uh, pick an issue, whether it's March Fong Yu and the pay toilet issue, remember? Yes. Her, her yes. Yes. claim to fame. Right. Um, you got to explain, explain that to the students about that's toilet. The students, <laughs> uh, when March Fong Yu was a member of the State Assembly from Oakland, she was the author of a bill that became law that outlawed pay toilets in public facilities. Now, that may sound like a joke, but obviously it hits a lot of people in the pocketbook and other places. And, and it's something that everybody could identify with and was an extremely popular issue. Years after that, when I was working on the staff of Senator Roberti, I know Senator Roberti used to carry around in his head, why can't I think of my equivalent of a pay toilet issue. I think most 
many, if not most, elected officials wonder, you know, what's the key to that, that, that breakthrough issue that enables me to establish an identity? And, and I think in some ways, you might be able to say that the pay toilet issue was more important to March Fong Yu getting elected Secretary of State than the fact that she was the daughter of a, of a, a Chinese laundryman in Oakland. Uh, you know, and, and in my case, I think that, while well, I didn't have the pay toilet issue, but I think that if I had not taken a position calling for the resignation of Chief Gates uh, back in 1992, uh, following the Rodney King incident, which for me was a breakthrough event to the African American community, e even although in the subsequent mayoral election, I mean, I, I did spend more time from January to, to May of 1993, visiting churches in the African American, I went to, I went to, I spent a lot more time in churches during those six months than I did in the previous 40 years of my life. Uh, but, but it, it built a base, and ultimately, you sound, you sound like a Catholic. Well, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, I'm I mean, sorry, I, oh, I was. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that Father yeah. Lawton had entered the room. No, but, but. I was ultimately able to get 85% of the African American vote in, in the mayoral election um, after, I mean, in a, at a time when there was a lot of tension between African Americans and Latinos at a certain grassroots level. And that was a higher percentage than I got from Asian Americans when I ran for mayor. And I think it had a lot to do with I had a breakthrough issue and I built upon it. So some politicians, some candidates are lucky to find a breakthrough, whether it's pay toilets, whether it's something else. If, if you don't have that, I think it's harder to run in a, in a large-scale race. Mark, is there such a thing as Jewish politics in Los Angeles? Yes. Okay, what is it? But, <laughs> and it's evolved. Um, at the time when I first ran, in, which was 1989 when I was elected, and before then, there was something called the Waxman-Berman machine. Um, Congressman Henry Waxman uh, and Congressman Howard Berman, um, both Jewish, um, who came out of the assembly, Henry Waxman older than Howard Berman. Um, They're both in Congress now. Both in Congress now, uh, both Jewish. Howard's brother Michael, a master at direct mail, and sort of invented the idea of micro-targeting and slate mailing. It didn't invent slate mailers, but really mastered that art form. So there was a time, which is less so today, but certainly in their prime, where democratic politics, Jewish politics were one and the same. And back to my earlier point, if you were to be elected to one of these many positions, it made all the difference in the world if the waxman Berman machine said it was going to be you instead of you. Typically, all the options were Jews. That was sort of taken for granted. So that didn't become a factor versus someone else. It was how does one of many Jews in these communities get elected, and at the time being anointed or endorsed by that machine, um, in almost all cases, few exceptions, um, was uh, determinant. Um, today, they're less focused on local politics in that way and are more senior in the Congress and focused on national you know, issues in, in Washington. So I think uh, it's a more open case now, and so among several Jews, like in the 5th Council District right now, there's a very competitive race with many Jewish candidates running. Um, it will be, to some extent, the money that they get and various interests, who are probably non-Jewish, getting state-level or city-level interests, putting their money behind a candidate that's going to get that candidate uh, ahead. So that's a presumption that we're Jewish. I think we haven't seen the demographic change in a lot of these neighborhoods, at least among the electorate, that we've seen in South L.A from African-American to Latino, or Inglewood, African-American to Latino, where you see that tension and there's sort of like one's going to win, one's going to lose, and we're fighting over a scarce resource. The Jewish community, there's not that sense. And in the top 100 jobs in the Jewish community, there's <coughs> not the same valuing of elected office, which is interesting. Um, the Jewish community would be more interested in the top 100 lawyers or trial lawyers or the top 100 doctors in terms of prestige. Um, the fact that I was on the school board and was Jewish was just not a big, huge deal. You, you were the, a disappointment to the, the Jewish community. In the Jewish community. <laughs> yeah. And I was one of four Jews on the school board at that time. If you are the only African American on the school board, and there's been just one African American for the last like 20 years, that is a much bigger deal and position of honor in that community and prestige in that community 
than it is in the, in the Jewish community. And the last thing I'll say is we haven't talked about on the top 100 the key appointed positions, mm -hmm. police chief, school superintendent, director of key county or city departments. In many racial communities, that's a big deal for them, the lobbying and jockeying that goes on to who gets appointed. That is generally a non-issue in the Jewish community. Again, on the prestige rank, being a superintendent of LAUSD is just not a big deal symbolically in the way that it would be to be the first Latino superintendent or African American superintendent. So that, I'm not sure what to make of that, but yeah, I mean, there are politics everywhere, but I think Jews have taken for granted in the last 20 years over-representation and therefore not losing sleep over who gets elected should so-and-so retire. Uh, it's sort of taken for granted. Okay. Well, let me get to that point about there are a lo limited number of seats. There are only 100. And some of us would say, hey, that is a black seat or that is a Latino seat. And then more important than that, and all of you have alluded to this, the importance of these positions is what you do with them in terms of public policy. And one of those is your ability to appoint a superintendent or a police chief. And that becomes very symbolic. And there's only one of those. There's only one LAPD and there's only one superintendent of, of LAUSD. And it becomes very controversial when one is African American or Latino and we want to, or they get replaced. We recently have gone through that with Superintendent Brewer. And um, personally, uh, Council Member Parks went through that in terms of the, uh, when he was police chief. Um, so once, we talked about sustainability, that once a, a position is African American and kind of remains African American, to some degree, does that hold true in, the, in terms of the executive positions? Once you have, certainly in Inglewood, once the police chief was African American, we've had every single police chief there, and I think there's been six now, have been African American. These bigger, the, in, in the city of LA and the school district, it's tough to sustain that, yet there was a outcry when you were replaced as police chief. Um, wh what are those politics, Councilman Parks, and what was your position when the, there was an attempt to replace, successful attempt to replace um, Superintendent Brewer. Did people come and talk to you from the black community saying, hey, you have to help out, don't let this happen? Well, I, I think first of all, uh, and I think what Mark was saying in, in the difference in different communities, I think it depends on in a great degree of what people's uh, uh, options have been in the past. So if they've been limited opportunities, then people are far more uh, holding on to them saying that this is the their lifeline or this the first success. If you are from a community that has limited financial uh, background or limited uh, number of business people, uh, so there's, there's limited options to begin to look at where you put your energies in. So you celebrate what you have. And so in some communities, the director of the local park is a hero because you've never had the director of the local park. And so I think it depends on what the community's experience when you figure with LAPD, a hundred and some odd plus years, and you begin to look at the relationship that if you go through the 60s and 70s, most of the uh, civil unrest or riots came about because the police versus uh, a bad shooting or a bad incident in the black community. If you go back even farther in the civil rights issues, the police were basically used as a weapon against human rights. They were called out with their dogs and uh, and uh, water guns and all that other stuff to keep people from expressing themselves. So there was this tension in the community that the police department in some communities are viewed almost like on a national level of being like the army. It's the last place that gets integrated, the last place that begins to begin sensitive. So minority communities take on uh, more of a sensitivity when that position is basically being appointed. and. Uh, contrary to anybody's opinion, the chief of police does set a tone as it relates to officers on the street. And if you uh, send a clear tone at what's not acceptable, officers are not going to do what is unacceptable. They may make mistakes, but if you ignore bad behavior, then bad behavior becomes the common ground. And so these are the kind of things that uh, you find. And when you go out, and as we talk about running for political office, the, mo the most unfiltered information you can get is running for office. When you walk up to someone's door, knock on the door and say hi, you have no, it's nothing censored about that interchange. And you get the most unfiltered information 
in the community than we ever get. So you get a sense of where people are about different issues. You get a sense of what their relationship is with the police department. Uh, you get a, and some of these things may go back 20 and 30 years, and it may go beyond that in the relationship that they're living through an issue that affected one of their family members that they weren't personally there at the time. So you begin to realize how hardcore feelings are about certain issues. You also find, as it relates to the police department, many people don't take the time to consider what police department. They just consider police or police. So if they see a video in Texas of a police officer beating a person in jail, that's all police. They don't care if it's Santa Monica, LA, New York, that's the police. Uh, the police have a tendency to say, look at us individually, not collectively, that wasn't us. And the community says, no, that is you. And what was remarkable about the remar uh, Rodney King tape is it validated in a lot of people's minds what they thought was going on all the time but never had the evidence for. So it just validated years and years of people saying, I was thumped here, I was, they did this, they were discourteous here. That was the symbol that then created the, the whole dynamic of the riot after the, the trial. But I think you find that people zero in on certain positions and it also has some relevance to their level of success in prior years. Uh, one of the things I think is uh, probably one of the more remarkable things in the city of LA that many people lived through but maybe not zeroed in on is that when we think about Tom Bradley as being the first uh, African American or black mayor of a major city, what we fail to realize is that he was a mayor for 20 years and never had a population of black community more than 17 percent in the city of Los Angeles. Now, mayors prior to him in other cities generally were voted in by an overwhelming population of a black community. He was the first one that carried that banner with a minority of the race that people would generally view as his base. So I think when you look at it, it just depends on a lot of degree on what people view as significant is what their prior achievements have been, whether they're still making first. And in some communities, it seems uh, you know, uh, kind of strange today to talk about there are people that are still making first. Uh, you know, and so when you think about it on a local level, we, we often still applaud the first of this, the first of that. Some communities are saying, what's the big deal? Well, because their first were 100 years ago, some communities are still celebrating their first, and I think they hold on to those dearly because they don't know when they'll achieve it again. And then if they believe there's any slight bit of unfairness in the process, then they are even more concerned because it then goes back to the collective view See, I told you we never get the fair shake in the first place. On Brewer's issue, now what was interesting to me is that... Just to tell students, Brewer, yeah. Brewer is the superintendent of LA Unified. What was interesting, or to, was, I'm as far as the people that came to me and talked about it, many people had no clue as whether Brewer was a good superintendent or not. What they didn't appreciate is how he was handled. And what you find in the way he was handled is all of a sudden you get, here's a guy that's putting along, going to meetings, being seen. Nobody has said a word about whether he's good or bad. And all of a sudden there's a meeting that says, we're gonna decide whether he stays. And people are saying, well, when did that happen? When did he go bad? And then the issue then comes up where half the board was there, it wasn't there. One person was leading the charge and people begin to speculate, well, is this being driven by the mayor? Who's doing this? And so it just becomes the rumor mill starts picking up and then the conspiracy theorists come up and then it becomes one of these plots. They were after him all the time. They never wanted him to be successful. And then when it finally happens, what solidified a lot of people's mind that it was a sham was that he's gone. They gave him his money and then all of a sudden people begin to talk within a week about how good the guy that replaced him was. And you're saying, well, he only had a week and he became good. The other guy was there for two years and you couldn't get a sense of what people thought about him uh, at all. And then they start talking about where the guy that replaced him was there as his number two and made all these improvements. You say, well, how did the superintendent not get credit for what he was doing? And so these are all the complications to where people go back in history and they begin to zero in on when you couldn't get a job, when you couldn't become a janitor, and they say, see, it's collectively the same old thing. They just did it to him at that level. And I think it's how he was dealt with.
So, Mark, when you were on the school board, you were actually the president of the school board. How many superintendents did you go through? Um, well, I worked with, with three, and the first guy who was white from Miami who didn't work out, and I was charged with one other member of telling him that we were going to let him go. And so when he left, there was then, there are two deputies, one African American, one Latino, and they were the two candidates, really, for the top job. Intense politics. Um, elected officials who I had never met calling me <laughs> day and night um, to weigh in. That was a big deal for some of the reasons that, that uh, Councilman Park said, to have a first um, in the African American and Latino community. So we went with the Latino, Bill Anton, um, didn't work out, long story, and then as he left in his place, we promoted the African American. There was that keeping score that was made very clear to us as board members within these communities. Uh, it was their turn, now it's our turn. We waited, we didn't give you a hard time when you did that, now you need to, uh, to even the score. Uh, and then Sid Thompson, who was African American, who served several years, I think was generally effective, he retired, and then there was intense pressure you were probably involved, the mayor was involved, again, really leaning on me hard to support... Richard Polanco never leaned on anybody the, hard. <laughs> it felt hard, and maybe it wasn't, maybe Richard remember, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it felt hard. If you look at the chart, school board's <laughs> right above the bottom in that level of pyramid, right? So you have people, up at mayor, senate pro tem, supervisor, whatever, calling you and sort of implying pressure, it, it, it felt hard. Um, and so the Latino community rallied around Ruben Zacharias as a Latino who had a career educator, generally a good guy. Um, I thought personally not effective, not the right guy, and at the end of the day I didn't support him. But, um, but he won. I got a, but he, he was supported by the majority, mostly and sadly I would say, not because in, if you looked them in the face they would say, on the merits he's the best guy, Mark, and your guy's is less. I got a lot of, privately, you're right, he's not the best guy, you're right, your guy's probably better, but I can't stand the heat that I'm getting as an elected official. I've got to do but, this, and the board voted But isn't the criteria to to. have established leadership? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a difficult thing. But I think the theme of this conversation is this overlap between skills, ability, qualifications, on the, some ob objective merit measure that we could create and the intense important, particularly in communities that have been shut out historically, where it is their first, haven't had a seat at the table, haven't had access to power, it becomes a really big deal for them um, that this job be given to somebody from their community. And I can understand that rationally, mm -hmm. but as a policymaker, and, and easy for me to say as a non-Latino, it was like, no, I'm gonna go with the guy who I think is gonna serve kids better and do a better job for the school system and not ascribe to racial politics. But that's easy to do when you represent a district that's overwhelmingly white and Jewish where I wasn't getting heat. They would have supported me whichever way I went. But in other parts of the city, this was a, some of the most intense racial politics I've seen were around the Reuben Zacharias appointment. Then you guys fired him. After I left the board, the awesome. board that, that did go with him later became dissatisfied. That's a whole long story. But. And, the, the, in, and the reality today, the dropout rates are just as high. The issue of non-credentialed teachers is still not fixed. And the list goes on and on and on. And so uh, we've paraded many and very little in terms of performance has occurred. So maybe, I mean, it's just a structural problem. The school district's too big. Or Abs I think, you know, the whole debate, it's too big, it, we ought to break it up. Breaking up a school district for the simple reason of breaking it up is not good enough. Can't do it for that reason. But if you begin to look at the economy of scales of where it makes sense to keep certain things intact, such as your health care and your retirement, where it makes sense, absolutely, the decentralizing, the breaking up of school district to the boundaries that exist today, to me, make a lot of sense if, in fact, you bring to it the benchmarks, a, a, a benchmark on by when will we have credentialed teachers in every classroom? By when and what's the strategy to reduce the dropout rate? And hold people accountable at a much more effective, more performance-based outcome delivery system than what we have 
today as we speak, irrespective of who's been there. Because when it's all said and done, they've all failed. Yes. You know, I think one of the things we run into, and in, in if we had, in many instances, just the objective criteria and say who's best, then a computer can do it. But the, the, the subjective evaluation is the most difficult because you're overlaying all of these other concerns. And just as uh, we talked earlier about the issue of the school district, one of the things that I think what people run into is that, yeah, you get a sound bite, and the sound bite is break it up. And if you find that a subject is so simplistic that you can solve it with a sound bite, you shouldn't even be talking about it. The issue, if it's complex enough to have a discussion, you don't have that ability on a campaign trail to have a discussion. So people pick out a sound bite and say, break it up. And the people that are saying no are saying, wait a minute, you need performance criteria, you need credential teachers, and people saying, I only have 13 seconds for this story on TV. So you don't get that message across because most of this stuff is far more complex than a sound bite. But people that often are successful can hit that sound bite, and it may not even be something that they believe in or that they are supporting. It just happens to be able to resignate a two-word deal or a three-word deal that people go, I can go with that. But nobody's ever s figured out, what are the ramifications of blowing up the school district? Nobody's ever sat down and said, well, wait a minute, there's 800,000 students there. How do you get them to class? How do parents? By the time you figure it out, most of you come back and say, well, let's not blow it up. Let's see what we can do to fix it. And the final analysis, if they're not graduating at a higher level, if, if teachers aren't credentialed, if uh, you still have larger classes, if you still have 3,000 kids in the school, if all those things are still there, then it's been a lot of effort for little result. But the issue of all of this stuff comes up sound bite type of po uh, political issues have probably destroyed most relevant conversation about the true meaning of a lot of these issues. Can I just one foot on the breakup thing? My bigger fear is not breakup or not breakup the district. My biggest fear is that the community, the media, and civic and city elites have walked away from the school district. That the passion that Richard really feels is just the exception that people think it's impossible, it's hopeless. We have an open seat in the district on the LA School Board that LMU is within the, the district, uh, District 4. No media coverage whatsoever. I don't think the LA Times has written one single story. No media coverage whatsoever. The turnout March 3rd, my prediction will be in the 15% of registered voters will participate. It's sort of like not my problem. All our kids are in private school or a charter school or something. I might have an opinion about breakup, not breakup superintendent, but it's hopeless. It's not my problem. And to me, that's the biggest threat is people. And I, you know, the mayor who I love as a person, I'm frustrated with that he has walked away from the larger issue of the fate of LAUSD to take his ball and go play with a couple schools in one neighborhood. And so if the mayor of our very city is like, eh, it's impossible. Um, and the voters aren't voting, then it, it's really worrisome to get at these deep, important issues. Um, and, and that's my fear, is that we're now beyond fighting intensely for racial politics. So it just doesn't matter. I don't even care anymore. And that's really dangerous for something as profoundly as important as educating kids. Yeah, but that's part of the fragmented nature of L.A. politics. On that board, we, uh, we have an, the L.A. school board, which means that the mayor or councilman Parks has no impact on school policy. Then we have the college board, which runs its own. And then we have the MTA board, which is separate, runs transportation. So it's just fragmented politics, not, on, not necessarily on ethnicity or geography, but even just in terms of policy. So it really fragments all that. Let's have some questions from the students, but uh, while the students think about what questions they're going to ask and they're going to raise their hand if they want extra credit. I'm going to raise your hands. <laughs> Do you want extra credit? <laughs> um, the, the interesting thing is, Education is n number one issue in every poll. We always see that. And in the top 100 positions, when we see the recruitment how they, in the early years, meaning in the 60s and 70s, if you were on the school board or on the community college board, it almost guaranteed that your career would be launched. Jerry Brown started on the community college board, ends up being governor. 
Kathleen Brown starts on the school board, ends up being state treasurer, the Democratic nominee for governor. Um, Diane, Watson. Diane Watson, now a Congress member. Uh, Antonovich was on the school board, and he's now a, a community college board. He's now a, a, a supervisor. Um, members of Congress, uh, council members, all that came from, you know, like Rita Walters, et cetera. Rita Walters then is, and Jackie Goldberg then, are the last school board members to get elected to higher office for about 20 years. And then Jose Huizar is then the first one that, that breaks that. You will, then got punished for being in that policy area because people perceived that, that yeah, and including you, Mark, when you ran for higher office, I think it hurt you being on the school board, not helped you, whereas the previous group, it, 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 had, it, it had helped. So just an observation from some of the data that we, we saw in terms of that recruitment. Okay, questions, comments? Adan, please. And you know what, we're gonna ask you to speak into the mic just because we wanna record it more than anything else. Um, this is going towards the um, school system. Um, I worked in the summer for Green Dot um, schools, and um, I noticed that uh, the other question that I wanted to ask is, uh, how have animal schools run by Green Dot have affected the school system? Isn't that privatizing education and ign ignoring others as a whole? Mark, that sounds like a question for you. The last part of your question, you said, isn't it? I'm, I didn't Privatiz hear. Privatizing, privatizing education? Not private. I mean, I'm generally pro charter schools in the sense of encouraging innovation and putting authority and control locally at the school site, which I really believe in. And was I, I was on the school board in the old days. Those were the first charters that were ever approved were back then when, when we started that. So I'm, I'm a believer in charter schools. I wish the community and the charter school backers, people like Eli Broad and, and many others who are really important civic leaders, would not see it as either or. In the minds of a lot of these folks, it's like LAUSD, hopeless, we tried to fix it, didn't work, never work, let's just focus on charters. Nothing wrong with charters, but the stakes for our community are if 90% of the kids are in one system and 10% are in the other system, where is the higher stakes? The higher stakes will remain with the larger system. I'd like to see the district embrace charters as something that's part of LAUSD, we're proud of Green Dot rather than doing battle with Green Dot, that that's one way of serving kids, but we're in it together and we're all worried about the big picture. That's what I fear that we're losing. People care deeply about education and polls, you know, number one interest. People definitely care, particularly for their own kids, but they've lost the sense of LAUSD as a viable ongoing entity. It's, and, and that's my concern is that we punish the kids. So forget LAUSD as a bureaucracy, whatever you think about it. It's all of those kids is the only shot they got is to, to have a better future and to have quality schooling. And if the community leadership, mayor, council, supervisor, everybody, whatever, says it's hopeless, then that's doing a deep disservice to a generation of kids. And that's what I worry about. So charters are great, but not at the expense of letting go of the larger system. Mark, why, why'd you quit the school board? Well, similar to Councilman Parks, my wife would have shot me had I run again. I, I was elected to Well, we know that in Councilman Parks' household there is a gun. <laughs> so is there a gun? <laughs> she, would have, she would have found a gun. <laughs> Another part of the prestige ranking, not only was the school board second from the bottom, but our annual salary was $24,000. Um, and we were all but prohibited from having outside income because of all the potential sort of conflicts between everybody doing work with LAUSD. So after eight years of working seven days a week and having a political life and getting $24,000 a year, my wife working and us having young kids and all that, she's, I mean, it wasn't really a choice. It was really a life or death choice. And after eight years, it's sort of been there, done that. I was ready to kind of move, move on. But I would have been shot and the chief would have been involved and it would have been very <laughs> ugly. <laughs> And Tiffany? And then expand that a little bit to the, all the, for instance, in LA, we have voters of Los Angeles have supported the school district with billions of dollars of, of um, for bond money. We have said that. Uh, yet they've also, kind of what Tiffany's question is, said, no, but we want an independent board to, to do that. But in a sense, we, we then take, we took the city, we took the school board away from the city, 
and had a school board, and then we take the bond issue away from the, um, um, the, the school board itself, and so we continue to fragment it e even further. Yet, uh, Tiffany's question it resonates with a lot of people that they want even more oversight. Yeah, I think oversight is important. Um, as explained, there are committees that have oversight. Your question is, should there be oversight on, on the board itself? <clears throat> I think the oversight and the responsibility rest with the electeds, starting with them. The legislature who funds, for all intent and purpose, education throughout California should play a, 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 could play a more active role. I attempted to do that um, when I was in the legislature by authoring a measure that was going to have these performance-based outcomes very specific, giving the school district four years to implement. Um, I couldn't get it through. It didn't happen. Uh, and uh, I, I received a call from a potential superintendent candidate, my dear friend Henry Cisneros, who lobbied me to drop the bill uh, or he would not consider coming, saying that it was tying up his hands. And my question to him, well, are you really serious? Because if you are, I'll take it into serious consideration. But if you're not, you got to tell me, because I don't intend to do that. I think this board. Uh, much along the lines that they've been very successful in going to the people, getting support for bonds, should come to the people and say, look, here's our deficiency in credential teachers. This is what it's going to cost, and we don't have the, the money. Are you willing to pay for that? And here are the schools where the credential teachers' uh, numbers are, and here's the plan that is going to be implemented, and bring it to the people. You know, I was interested in your pyramid chart, mm -hmm. you know, the pyramid of power, what's missing up on top is the people, the voters, the diversity of voters, because that's where it really is. And policymakers have a tendency to forget that. And so, no. And, I, and I, academics, obviously. And, and <laughs> academics, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, a, a lot of it is not, you know, recreating anything. A lot of it is just putting it down, having the courage and looking at your friends in the eye and say, hey, we got to do this and we're going to do it. You're with us or you're not. And then just have the courage to move it forward. Something like that makes so much sense. Something like that I think people will get. And you know, you, you don't need another body to supervise this particular body. The legislature, by virtue of their representation uh, and, and duty and obligation, uh, should be sufficient. OK, great. So does money trump ethnicity is one question. Um, second, can only Latinos address Latino issues or can blacks only address black issues and the, the sensitivity to that? Um, the future of racial politics, okay? Are we in a post-racial America now with the election of Obama and this new generation coming up? And then the specific appointments, how do you measure what uh, good being a, a Latino on the state senate or in the council, if you haven't elected a, a you know sergeant of arms or appointed a sergeant of arms or or a general manager? So, uh, Richard, you could answer all four with <laughs> one sentence, or you could just focus on one uh, uh, at your pleasure. I'll, I'll focus on on the question you asked. Yes, I believe that you do not have to be an ethnic minority to address ethnic minority issues. Absolutely. The experience, having said that, the experience that an ethnic minority legislator brings is going to still be a little different. And the issues that affect that constituency are going to be issues that, if you look who authors them, will speak for itself. Mark, what question would you like to answer? Or you can mix them up. To sort of looking to the future or, or where might we be. I, I think Barack Obama could be seen as a historic turning point. Um, and, and not that it's over. He's the beginning of a new era and a new generation. Um, and you could just do the demographics to look like how old are us, how old are all of, of us, and how long will we still be around? Um, uh, <laughs> It is tempting for younger people to say this talk about racial politics is so old school, it's so yesterday, get over it, come on, it's 2009. It's hard for people who have lived the life of being 
uh, a Congressman John Lewis, who was beaten almost to death in the civil rights struggle. People who grew up in L.A. where they couldn't move to neighborhoods because the covenants prohibited blacks or Jews from buying homes, including the house that I live in in Westchester. The law has since struck that down, but the underlying historic document that we signed when we bought our house in the mid-90s has that language that I'm asked to sign or get a copy of or initial or whatever the process is, and you want to say, well, wait a minute, what's this about no blacks or Jews? Well, that doesn't apply anymore. That's, that's no longer legal, but it's there and it's real. So for those who, and I don't want to equate the two by any means, but for a generation or multiple generations that have lived the life of being denied access and not having a chance, never seeing someone who looked like them in the leadership of LAPD, never having somebody who looked like them as mayor or president or congressman or whatever, we just cannot deny the significance of that. That is profoundly defining in terms of their identity. As that generation gets older, dies and moves on, and as your generation emerges, I think that does become more historical, and people move to a point where you don't define yourselves in the same way, I think, as it's all about the life I've led and how I have been shut out, denied, and discriminated against. So we've got to let that time go, but as it does, we can't belittle it. That's one of the lessons that I learned in many ways on the school board. There was an issue around Sid Thompson, and, was it, and he wasn't hired when we hired Bill Anton. And I was summoned to a group of elderly African-American leaders in South L.A., and I went down off of Vermont, south near Manual Arts High School, and they lectured me for a long time about why this mattered to them. And it gave me a much deeper appreciation to have been in that experience than if you just kind of look back and say, why does that matter? So I think we all shouldn't be too quick to belittle those who think that race matters. But knowing that the good news is flashing forward 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I think the history is going to be more moving beyond that, more multiracial and less hung up on that. So the president's black, who cares? So he's an Asian, whatever. Who cares the religion? We're beyond that. We're not yet beyond that. And we need to honor the lives of those people who aren't yet beyond it. Councilman Parks? I, I think that, uh, as I've seen over my lifetime, it's an evolution. And so each time every group gets their turn in the barrel. Years ago it was uh, Irish. You go back through our history and every new arrival uh, has been, had their opportunity. I think that in the future, if we're going to get beyond racial politics, is that we can't forget or lose the sensitivity of human relationships to where we in, are inclusive for everyone if we want that as a goal. Uh, I don't think, as many people have said, the election of Obama pretty well says affirmative action works and so let's go back to where we were. I think the election of Obama really draws a line and says all the work we need to do in the future to where you look up and say it is not a national or international uh, uh, holiday because this occurs. Uh, but again, it's up to the next generations to understand the role and not go back into the history that got us into segregation, lynchings, and where people were at one time viewed as one-fifth of a person and all those things. If we ever forget that and it becomes part of our being as it relates to the future, there'll be some other group that you, someone will select as being on the outs. And whether it's gays or whatever, the new generation of pointed at a group saying you're not one of us and when you're excluding people, you will just evolve to where the next group of politics is about some other issue of exclusion. Count, uh, former council member Mike Wu. And students, you've been wonderful. I know class was over 15 minutes ago, but. Um, uh, I wanted to say that I think that some individuals are moving into a post-racial phase, but I don't think our society as a whole is moving into a post-racial phase. And my sense of it is that, in particular, I think that many African Americans and many Latinos still have an extremely passionate ethnic identity. But I'm tending, I tend to think that for a lot of whites and a lot of Asian Americans, that ethnic identity may not be as important. And what that means politically could be that more whites and Asian Americans may be more open to voting for an African American or a Latino. I'm not sure that is going to work so much going in the other direction. Um, I also wanted to say, I, I, as a slightly discordant note, you know, most of our conversation for the last hour has been an intensely local conversation. Maybe that makes sense because that's, we're here at a, a center for the study of Los Angeles. But I think one of the ways that 
my thinking has changed over the last 10 or 15 years is that I think, I, I find myself thinking a lot more about being part of a larger world. I think about global warming, I think about how the economy is becoming globalized, and, and it leads me to want to say, if you're sitting in the audience there, and you're 18 or 19 years old, whether you want to run for the assembly or the city council or school board someday, or whether you want to play some part in the larger world, I would strongly recommend, if you're 18 or 19 years old, you should learn to speak Spanish and Mandarin. Yes. Hey, I want to uh, thank our panelists. and.